Good day, everybody. Okay, welcome to the May 8th meeting of the OSC Dev Team. Um, let's get started here. So let me get you the link in case you're not looking at it. Okay, there's the meeting link. And let's begin. Screen share. Okay. A little five-minute intro, or maybe maybe a little more. I'm not seeing too much content from others here, so I'm gonna <clears throat> talk for as much as 15 minutes. Um, I know Lex is not here, so Abe's got five minutes. Ruslan has five minutes. That might be old. Okay progress reports how's everything doing so I am almost up at uh, releasing the OSC immersion announcement so if you click on that on the first page I'm not sure if you can see the video the video is not public yet but it's pretty decent it's four minutes uh, really trying to lay out the summary of what we've done and you can read about the the summary of the OSC fellows training and OSC boot camp so the immersion is going to be for five weeks total but why not make the first week itself a more general one and call it the OSC boot camp so that's basically an introduction to all that we do the rapid prototyping and focusing on a, on the micro factory also combined with a build of a 3d printer so of course if you attend that you will get a taste of of an extreme manufacturing workshop where we build a few of these printers and um, our goal being about five hours at present and then the deeper immersion training really trying to get you to a full mastery of what it means to run workshops uh, which is our current revenue model that we have proven over the years if you'd like to see uh, some of the the proofs of concept if you go to the open source leadership summit presentation you can actually see um, if you haven't seen the video, it might be instructive to see it, but the slides on slides 61 through 63, we show some of the milestones on revenue generation. So OSC, there's actually a separate page called OSC Bootstrap Funding Milestones, but we've been running workshops for years since about 2012, and uh, they work in terms of getting an attractive audience to come, come to, the, to the workshop where we combine education and training and those are huge huge markets right so education uh, is a four trillion dollar market and production is a uh, I looked at the numbers it's an eleven trillion dollar market worldwide and we're actually trying to take it make a dent in that uh, so the way we're trying to propose the program is that we're uh, we, we are definitely proposing that the that the model of workshops themselves is very scalable. It's a bootstrappable model and it's scalable. And in the immersion training, we build the small micro factory consisting of the five, five tools, the CNC circuit mill, uh, 3D printer, filament maker, small laser cutter. Uh, but in that opportunity, teach people how to not only build some of these things, but how also to run not only the the immersion builds but development events so that means all the skills of, of of large parallel teams working together on design as well integrating with with that with incentive design challenges like the the hero x and uh so, so yeah design sprints and the the design jams integrating all the techniques that we have developed relying on the crowd crowd process and a collaboration architecture where you architect you break down the project into many many parts and you assign roles to each but of course the block there is open source tools which are coming in open source tools are not bad especially if we provide the open source microfactory level one 
but the I think the the biggest challenge is of course the te the skill set to understand the development process, what tools to use, how to use FreeCAD, how to prototype. Uh, so there's a huge skill set involved, but we can take this all over to libraries, to schools, everywhere. So I'm very excited about the prospects and already s starting to make contacts with uh, different organizations, including things like even summer programs, universities, libraries. Um, because if we have four, the goal is four full-time people working with OSE after the September training. And uh, that means like a workshop a week on average, which is crazy. You know, that, that requires a lot of organization. So, of course, there's going to be a, a program manager has to be in place to assure the logistics and marketing and so forth, the basic organization. But the deal is fellows so we're calling this a fellowship actually frame it in the in the word of a fellowship uh, an opportunity to do something excellent you get paid um, uh, the program costs but the result is that you're working and getting paid for doing that work um, and what else 25% of the time you spend running workshops and then we, we can liberate 75% to further research and development. And the main roadmap would be, so right now it's the OSC Microfactory Level 1, September 2018, but I'm planning on, uh, let's just continue the immersion training, May 2019, full Microfactory. So as soon as we get the people after September, we work, make sure the CNC torch table comes in online so we can teach about that and teach about how we build heavy duty CN heavy duty machines with the CNC torch table. So um, that's definitely, uh, we're far on that. And then for September 2019, get into the much larger stuff, the open source construction, CEB press, building aquaponic greenhouses or small seed eco homes as we leverage the work <clears throat> that we've already done with Open Building Institute to and Katarina uh, doing the immersion training on that so we're so probably in 2019 Katarina uh, she doesn't know how well prepared she will be but at least for OSC side I definitely want to teach about the brick press and uh, the and <coughs> open source construction as well as of course the modular build techniques from open building Institute and so so we're kind of that's you know that's early to talk about that but we definitely want to get that program up online in September of next year not this year but next year and then in 2020 move on to the open source agroecology so what does that mean uh, open source perennial polyculture plant breeding aquaponics for regenerative agriculture and food security so we're talking about terraforming regenerating the land key line plowing plant breeding like the 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 breed the actual the, the nuts that I have growing here 10 acres of them there's not not actually not many survivors but plant breeding for perennial polyculture in other words we have two choices we have GM uh, nanotechnology genetics uh, Franken foods as a choice or integrated agroecology as the alternate to that if you come from an integrated perspective as opposed to the the siloed perspective or let's say the uh, reductionist perspective of, of say genetic engineering towards agriculture because there's different ways we can do it either could work and each one will have its associated properties uh, we favor of course the integrated route of open source agroecology uh, which once again is a distributive method as opposed to more concentrative like like say genetic engineering uh, in other words we gotta use technology wisely that's always the common theme and Okay, and then, so that's May 2020 for open source agroecology, and then September 2020, so this is kind of the, like the three-year roadmap for immersion trainings. Um, then we get into integrated humans. Shifting gears from open source appropriate technology to opening up the human dimension. How do you like that? So uh, you can read more about integrated humans, what that means on the wiki. Uh, so so you can read through that, and that's, that's what we've got so far. But I'm working on... Um, really uh, doing the financial model uh, as well as the detailed program the relatively detailed program for the boot camp is already up up there and I'm gonna detail out the full OSC immersion training so definitely I mean this is taking longer than I would like of course but we gotta do this uh, definitely he's gotta gotta put the time into defining this and and that means for the uh, so, so let's take a look at the critical path for the 
the immersion program, there's a bunch of stuff we have to do on the 3D printers, the filament maker, CNC circuit mill. So right now, uh, early July, uh, July 6th through the 8th, we're planning the, I talked to Shane, we're, we're confirming that as the CNC circuit mill workshop where we've got good results on that. And we may make that either like where we build a bunch of them or build less of them and focus on actually how you use use the circuit mill and how do you do circuit design using KiCad and every and the full tool chain there and Copper Carve, which is Shane's open source software for for doing the circuit milling. Um, so that's definitely coming up there. And we talked briefly about uh, let's do a get together at Factory Farm here, where we focus on the filament maker, so we can show the full tool chain of how we go from scrap to back to printable printable objects using filament uh, and for that we, we'd want to get the filament width sensor added to the 3D printer meaning that if we have crappy filament that's not holding tolerance it's still quite usable because there's a correction within Marlin for filament that varies in width over the over the spool so that's that uh, as far as the D3D laser workshop here that's um I've talked to Jeff Moe from Lulzbot. He's also putting out a laser head edition for Lulzbot, so there's common ground there that we can collaborate. And one other big missing link for the open source microfactory level one is the online 3D printing, like like actually getting a on demand printing service. I want to teach about that during the immersion program. So I'd like to reach out to Gina, who's the lead octoprint developer from Germany. Uh, I'd like to have her teach on that and before that uh, possibly finish getting up our cluster here so we can do a basically a web web interface where you can print on demand which would be relevant for for doing kits like say we do the workshops we can go right on our online interface so make that a public interface such that people can order parts from us um, through an online interface and that would be great and and that's that's basically leading to the home scale micro factory uh, the concept of the open source everything store but I think there's I mean there's there's a big message there so far 3d printing has not realized any of this potential of distributed manufacturing in, in any significant way I mean there's a lot of stuff on Thingiverse and other places but a lot of it is not good and it, you know a lot of it is not even printable the idea is how can we leverage crowd collaboration to develop high quality products that are real products that can be sold and built in local communities I mean damn it it's about time for that and with the open source microfactory level one I think we can put push that forward quite a bit especially if we're going with the closed loop material cycles the circular economy of taking scrap plastic and and melting it down into filament so uh, that kind of narrative really needs to be exposed because uh, I think there's just huge potential I mean think about going to libraries and high schools colleges everywhere and teaching people the open methods where uh, I think one one good format for that is if we have a number of us working on this then we can do these collaborative uh, incentive competitions uh, with HeroX or other incentive design platforms where like say on a weekend we do a competition okay let's build an additional tool head for the open source 3d printed cordless drill or whatever product it is a digital camera based on the Raspberry Pi and 3D printed parts, all of that, micro, you know, drones, I mean, all these kinds of products. Uh, it's my opinion that 80% of the consumer household goods can probably be produced by individuals uh, running small businesses all over the world, as opposed to Amazon and Walmart. Uh, I think we can, uh, well, I, personally, I think it's inevitable that, that Walmart and I'm Amazon uh, will be dented by open source distributed production now how quick does that happen we don't know that's what we're working on but it's inevitable in a simple sense that it's distributed the information flows there are more rapid it's not centralized we've shown through history that centralized systems don't work communism collapsed in the 1980s 
uh, <laughs> uh, centralized operations have their weaknesses. Distributed information flows according to information theory are, are the preferred way and only if uh, the open hardware revolution comes into play. I've heard actually, you know, Bunny Huang, he's one of the lead open source hackers out there. He's mentioned that, and I was talking to Katarina about this, that open source hardware may take off really once Moore's law for, for computing power kind of uh, plays out. I mean, it will never play out, but we think in probably 10 years, silicon Moore's law will reach its peak. Uh, but one claim is for when the open source hardware economy is gonna really take place, is when open source or hardware in general becomes really really advanced uh, which is signified by reaching Moore's law in about 10 years with computing power so that means like full digital fabrication capacity is on anyone's desktop probably 3d metal pr printing is on everyone's desktop and so forth but anyway that's just some thoughts there uh, so that's that's where, where I am here. Um, one also very interesting thing on a CEB press, just to wrap up, I had a conversation with uh, some people who are doing some big projects in Africa, and they were actually asking me, okay, put together a program for how you can go to Africa and train like a hundred of their people to do like a massive build out like we're talking about like a whole subdivision of CEB there's this CEB builder and a funder uh, an investor guy I talked to uh, a builder who's an architect who likes CEBs and he's got he's drawn up plans for a whole settlements ie or subdivisions that are made from CEB so they want to have a big sw they, the labor is there like in Africa they take Africa labor is there they don't have the machines they don't have the skills to do it and they were implying that they cannot go with a regular CB machine an off-the-shelf one because the common story in Africa is that when it breaks you're kind of done for because you cannot get parts so that's where OSC version with common off-the-shelf parts replaceability would be a, actually a viable model so so I'm gonna to put together a little plan for how that would look like what what it would take to train like say a dozen to a hundred people to operate and run the machines and be able to fix them and of course build them because that I mean that's what it would take but I like I like that discussion that's the first discussion ever I had at that level where people are actually saying yes we actually need to train people to be fully resilient in that technology because my statement about Africa from a long time has been unless the material supply chains are there, or we bring them in the open source microfactory, then any technological project in Africa is pretty much doomed, just as as has been experienced throughout history, where all kinds of machines are scattered throughout Africa, because once they break, you cannot fix them, or people scrap them for parts or whatever. So just a heads up, that, that was an interesting discussion, and, and it's a question of like when that's going to happen. But the interesting part was uh, these people were like, okay show me data that your machine can produce a million bricks well we don't have that the most we pressed with a single machine was about fifty thousand bricks so uh, part of the project as, as i mentioned in a roadmap for ne uh, the immersion training i believe in september of not this year but next year part of that would be to getting some data like just running the cb press 24 7 to, to actually get real longevity data of how the machine wears out over time that's something uh it's definitely an agenda for the future as the machines uh, need to roll out and, and be really reliable for like a, the, the number is like a million bricks which is probably like um, a house would be like say 10,000 bricks or so so like one machine has got to be able to build at least a hundred houses um, before it needs to get repaired or refurbished or something like that but that's the kind of level of, of uh, functionality we're looking at okay with that I'll be quiet here and uh, move on to further people so um, Abe, do you want to continue on that, on the power cube? Because we're going to need some power cubes for those those power cubes to run for a million bricks. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Let's see, I've uh, been updating the CAD. Let's see, I haven't uploaded a file or, or captured this, so I guess I should do that. I, I've been... Um, trying to get to the plumbing, but still thinking about certain frame stuff, and I I can finalize the frame because I've been having some trouble lately using FreeCAD as easily as I was for, for some reason. It seems a little bit slower, and I'm, I'm using FreeCAD Legacy, um, 
now the version 16, they refer to it as legacy. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, let's see, let me post. Um, so I guess I could share my screen too. Let me. Yeah. Let's see, so we should download, this is the 7-Eleven. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, you know what, actually I haven't uploaded this file yet, have I? Uh, yeah, would you mind hitting like upload on that for, no, I have a yeah, May 7. I haven't, yeah, I haven't finished quite all the tweaks on some of the parts, but that's okay. Um, the, Are you uploading it right now? It's pretty small, yes. so yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, anyone taking notes here? Who who, who is taking notes? Is that Jen or who do we have here? Okay, so let's see, did I share my screen right now? Hey, this is Jen. I don't know if I got unmuted before. Yes, I am. Okay, thank you, Jen. Yeah. share your screen let's see are you are you sharing your screen yeah there you are yes if it's showing up um so i those on the, probably needs more details on those and one thing i was noticing earlier they still need up to update i think the the frame and from the cad it looks like the engine height is over 16 and a half inches and um the frame goes about 16 inches on the opening, so the thinking about creeping and reducing the width of this bottom of the frame to make it easier to get the engine out, they're either making that curved or a lot of different shapes there, or just reducing the at the bottom of these sides. Uh, that way the engine is easier to get in and out, because obviously that's the only way it's going to come in and out. You can't get it through the top or the bottom. And obviously we want to be able to weld the frame together and then put the engine in and in and out. So that that's a little bit of a potential issue um, because I, th I think hopefully the engine frame isn't you know 17 inches. I'd yeah. have to in increase right, the size right. of the cube, uh, make it taller just to be able to get the engine in and out because uh, mm. it, it doesn't really need to be as tall as it is now just to fit it. Um, and I guess the thing I was thinking about was the, the the frame shouldn't be too weak. I don't think once it's welded together, I mean, the only issue I can think of as far as it being weak, if I narrow that down from two inches or to widen down this hole, um, is it, it sits on the top of, like, say, the back of the large tractor. If it takes a hit from something large, the only weak point in this thing is if it bends up enough that it makes the tank leak. Uh, mm -hmm. And then that would be a major... Uh, Steel, quarter right? inch is pretty solid. Yeah. It's, it's, if it bent, bent a little because something heavy hits it, it it's probably not going to cause any damage. Uh, let's see, I did work on the front gray there. I kept changing that a little bit. Yeah, that looks, looks pretty good. Again because I, I put slots in there, but yeah. actually it'd probably be more useful if I did, if it did a different pattern um, in there. I was just the best thing would be to cut some pieces out of the front there that are actually more usable than just slots. That way the pieces that come out can be used for something else, right? Uh-huh. That, 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 that's, that's, 
possible. Because I don't, I don't know what we would use those scraps for. Mm -hmm. So I might put a larger hole. Um, I might make the, the opening up above smaller or something. Maybe have a larger opening below. But I was going to put lots of small holes, but that's that's just an excessive use of the torch table. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. One thing I gotta tell you: that, uh, we need a hole for where the rubber mounts. You know, like how the, do you know how the, the cooler is attached? It's got a, this rubber piece that goes through the side, side tubes. A rubber piece that gets flattened out. It gets put put one of those two square holes. Like I don't know. If, uh, okay. So I thought in the other photos it looked like they were bolted, which is stuck through with big washers on that mesh. Yes. Yes, they are, but you don't have a hole for those. Where is that hole? That hole is at the... Let me share my so, screen again. I was wondering about that. If there could be holes, something that goes in between the pipe, that I don't know how... Um, you, you could attach it different ways, but bolts... That makes sense. I mean, are you sticking the bolts through fins in the cooler? Was that the... No, no. Here, uh, can you see my screen? If you look at my screen, see the see the mounting, uh, well, see the side tubes of the cooler. So there's a rubber block that, that fits right in a square hole, like one, either this or the other square hole. And when you put a bolt through it, it flattens out and pushes against the, the tubes without damaging them. So we need a hole for that um, based on the... Yep. You're just using a large piece of rubber. Which uh, comes with material. a... Yeah. It's a mounting kit for the hydraulic cooler. That's a part we actually oh, buy. It comes, with, it comes with the cooler. And which we would, of course, love to print once once we're printing rubber filaments. That, that would yeah, be a great I mean, part to print. It sounds like it's just a big washer. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like so. a washer. But it's really really a rubber block, like a, like a rectangular rubber block. When you, yeah, basically when you tighten a bolt onto it, it flattens out and expands a little bit, making firm contact with the with the pipes. Okay, so I'll just have to figure out what the bolt size in that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah maybe look I at the BOM. Information a lot because then I, I guess it, I'll need to figure out the position better of the cooler up or down because I was trying to figure out how to position it related to plumbing. Plus the fan there, I was where it needed to be higher because of the potential cooling there, wherever it gets the best air there in front of the engine. Yeah. But um, yeah, I could put. I was thinking maybe I could put some other slots. Uh, if there's washers that can go on the front, then the hole size wouldn't have to necessarily be. It could be bigger than the bolt size actually, which would give it some play. Um, I think there's one two, on one on each side. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And it would go between the, yeah, the pipes on the cooler. Or something. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe, yeah, I could put, have it cut holes in a couple different spots down the side. And maybe, maybe slots and some holes, and then it would give some option as to the mounting position. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that the cooler, your drawing of the cooler is accurate enough that the holes will actually be right? <laughs> um, that cooler was drawn, I think I redrew that a little bit based on, well, I mean, some of it is from a previous cooler, but actually I thought I changed that a little bit. So yeah, I think there were different numbers online for the extents of the cooler, and I went with the maximum extents the largest numbers that I could see, and just generally looking at the photos, 
Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, no, that's another thing that we get to use uh, photogrammetry on. Yeah. Oh, man. Photogrammetry. Okay. So what I'm going to do... Okay. Check this out. Let's do this. I was thinking about that and I think it occurred to me how just how important that is because if we just go by the, the drawings from the... Or like the specs from the uh, from the manufacturer, it's it could be right, but we don't even know. So the the most accurate thing is photogrammetry. So I could easily. Uh, so here's what I want to do. I know that shiny objects are not good for photogrammetry. So what I'm going to do is take some black paint and pl- paint this thing, and also I'll take the engine because I have the engine and the cooler. I think I have spares. Of, I, I know I have more engines. Probably have spares of the cooler. And I'll hang it up by a by a wire from the ceiling, and then take pictures from all sides, and I'll pass the pictures on to the public, and we can say, okay, uh, who can process this for a 3D scan? So that would be we can uh, collaborate on that. If you can do it, or if someone else can do it, I I I should try that. I mean, I I do. Well, I, I will try that because it's something we really want to master, and it's one of the the steps we can do. Like, say we're at a a design jam in a physical location one of us could bring a part and we can actually do the scanning there and make uh, like say 3d printed models and stuff like that so we can do for example a full 3d printed model of the actual thing based on the scans and that way we can figure out uh, prior to building whether everything is gonna fit and I think I think that would be a, if we could master that kind of process where all of us are working together as a group of many people to make sure that everything fits, I think that will be very valuable. So, I will work on that uh, in the next, you know, next coming weeks here. Definitely, yeah, we got we got to do it because um, I was I was concerned that yeah, once we have that, I I want to make sure that a couple of things are are good. Like, say we got to re, you know, the things that fail are like the engine maybe and the pump or whatever. Okay, so we got to definitely allow for the pump and engine to be basically snapped in and out. One of these power cubes, the engine is only 300 bucks for 18 horse or like 16 horsepower. So, uh, for longevity purposes, we have to have that, or like field repair purposes, we want to set it up so that, say the engine breaks or something, or you need something fails, we can snap it out in um, in the middle of a job, like real fast, like five or ten minutes. So I want to see if we can design for that, because for example, for say we're doing a a rapid build uh, it's a good idea of course to have parts but if, if say an engine fails you know that's of course not good so we want to be able to have to have the on-demand repair, repair service which is something that's afforded by this modular design and it's impossible when you have off-the-shelf equipment like I mean we've been stuck here when say like a bobcat exploded on us and that there went that weekend for doing the digging and stuff like that so um, we want to pay attention that we have snap in a and out parts uh, and with that said Abe I want to ask you uh, tell me if we have a pump or engine failure how do we remove the pump and take out the engine is it currently possible within what you have right now let's see to unbolt the pump it looks pretty easy right you, you two bolts mm-hmm. the pump from the coupler yeah yep that's uh, I mean other than something to work with that mm-hmm um, and we need like one and a half yeah. inches of backwards motion, yeah. and it appears you have that, so you can snap out the pump. Yeah. Yep. It looks like there's enough clearance there. I keep. I've got these suction lines lower, and I keep thinking of moving those above the pump. But I think I think they're probably okay down there. Um, one thing I thought about that I'm worried about suction lines on the debris from the inside the tank. If if those lines are too close to the bottom. One thing that could be done there, if if dirt build up in there is ever really a problem or concern, is technically you could weld elbows on the inside and do them similarly to the return lines uh, mm-hmm. with the elbow depending <clears throat> up. That way it wouldn't suck dirt off the bottom. But that's an extra part. And, you know, I don't know that that's, that's necessary. Uh, I don't know how much of a, a issue uh, dirt getting into the hydraulic obviously i guess it's just built up from from wear on the pumps and so on but yeah that's why we have the filter the filter gets all that out yeah hopefully the filters handles that fine so um, there 
like an inch and a half, I think, from the bottom of this bottom section. Let's see. Um, uh, one question on which one of those five lines is actually feeding this pump? Because it doesn't really look like you've got one of them pointed towards this pump. Which one was yeah, it going to be? suggest maybe do an elbow right after the get maybe like uh, can you see my screen yes which is the suction the suction which side the, depending on which side it is red. we the red side is the suction that's it okay that's well uh, if that's the case then then uh, it's nice not to have loops because you can get an airlock in the loop uh, so it would be nice to just put an elbow there straight to that inlet, maybe. Yeah, okay. Maybe move this one out uh -huh. further and put an elbow. Um, yeah, I would suggest an elbow. Because, I mean, here, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing this and the loops are just problematic. Now, it, that's fine for other power cubes because you can go straight to other power cubes from this. But for this one, I, I don't see something happening without a loop of some, some kind. Um, yeah. Unless you're going from the one from the opposite side underneath or something where... Uh, yeah, Maybe I don't know. I actually move that. I could edit the, uh, the tank wall and actually move that one up higher too, that suction line, so that it's closer to the inlet on the pump, actually. Uh, well, you want to be uh, not be too close because uh, it's hard, like when you have a, a hose barb, that those hoses are pretty stiff. You need to have a little bit of wiggle room to put it on. They're they're very stiff. They're wire braided. Um, okay. So yeah, you need they just don't a have little. A lot of flex. Yeah, they don't have a lot of flex. So actually, you really have to manhandle getting that that hose onto the the barb. So. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, it's in direct line. Well, it's going to be difficult whether it's in line or not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you uh, put it as close to the edge as possible here, like this edge here, then there should be enough flex within the 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 tube. Like I'm saying, don't leave just like one inch between the two barbs. You're not going to be able to get a hose on that. You know. Yeah. Like leave a space okay, of like so six inches or so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I should probably move it up a little bit. Edge of the tank, yeah, yeah, away from the pump. Okay, so yeah, a little bit more custom design there. Um, okay, so that one you're saying up so that the fluid flows down. Well, I think so where you have the level right now, I think it's pretty good. If it's okay, yeah, because if the hose doesn't flex a lot, it may be hard to pin it up. Oh, yeah, up. Yeah, oh, I, I see, I see. It's, uh, fittings, these MPT fittings here are sections of pipe. Uh, well, I haven't, I haven't constrained these where they, I'm trying to really estimate it where I think how much everything is going to thread together. There's supposed to be at least a quarter inch, three eighths of overlap on the threads on MPT, most of these parts usually. And so I'm trying to get the constraints close to that to represent that and, and also how it's welded through. I think those are two inch sections, but, um, they may be different than that. Uh, and, and there's room, depending on how you weld them through the tank wall, uh, to align those to okay. different lengths. Um, yeah. And then they thread thread differently. Uh, I, I, well, I assume if you're putting Teflon on these parts, when you thread them together, that, that may change the threading distance too. But to some degree, that just have to kind of do some of that by hand. The positions aren't going to be exact. 
right. of threading. Right, right, but which is fine, that's alright. That gives you room for, for options, too, so... Um, yeah, because there's a bunch of parts that thread together, and so there could be quite a bit of variation, you know. Not, not a lot, but a quarter inch, Right, uh, and the hoses can take that up. Um, okay, as far as snapping the engine out of there, so right now it looks like the top is uh, slightly smaller than the engine. We have to turn it sideways? Is that... Um, or maybe I maybe cut down the top a little I bit. Sideways, I think it's wider. I think the easiest way to get it out is to make it so that you have to turn it, plus I don't know what kind of issues, turn it, you know, Gonna have fluid leaks and all that if you have to turn it, maybe you don't want fuel potentially leaking out and all that. So, um, I, I, I think that reducing uh, the side the width at the bottom there to like an inch, it's two inches wide at the bottom, uh huh. Then taking that down to an inch, uh huh. Something like that, and if at the top, I had to plus, I was just thinking of moving the the top plate so it fits over the top of the sides and then you have a quarter inch there uh -huh. three sides you'll get you know a quarter inch and an inch here and there and then it should come out easy and I, from the side the pad on that engine is pretty good it shows it measures at um, over 16 and a half inches so once it's less than 17 inches tall uh, when you go to lift it lift the engine out it should fit through there um, I could I could do something like shape the sides with curves so do just a low spot right there where it lines up the engine on both sides and then you can lift the engine on either side and still make a mirror, mirror images because you don't want to, you got to be able to take it out whichever side it's easier to get it out of, so, um, uh -huh. I, obviously it's if you take it off the tractor before you take the engine out, but it should be easy okay. to do, but, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, yeah, so basically cut down the top and bottom uh, side pieces to like an inch? Yeah, mostly okay. the bottom and yeah. maybe move the top up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that uh, sounds like a plan. Design the frame right now. It's a little harder to edit without changing all of it, but um, yeah, I, I think just... You know, another inch or so should should do it. Okay. It's shy less than an inch. I think I'm moving through there. All right. But the, the I guess the extend at the top of the engine is that is the cap, the fuel cap up there. Right. Which um, hopefully that that's fairly accurate. Want to have to take the fuel cap off? Although I suppose that's, that's always a possibility. Yeah. Or you can, yeah. The 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 cap is um, an extra inch. Maybe maybe you could do like a small indent just for the cap, so you don't have to cut out the whole side. Maybe. That that's true. I, I, I'm thinking at the bottom, it'd be easier to just do a yeah a, yeah a, 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 the bottom for that width down there. But yeah, the the cap is even smaller, so. Right. Yeah. That, Weaken the frame less. We just put some points where it's narrower. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 It should be. Should be decent. Yeah. I mean, the idea that the frame is weakened all at the like at this one point. That's not the greatest, but I think it will be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that should be fine. If there's like one inch left, that should be. Good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If there's uh, one inch left, it, that would be fine. Yeah, I suppose on the strength of the frame, I mean, if we were worried about it, we got these big openings technically. Some of this opening doesn't have to be that big, but then you need to build access to stuff too, so I hate to add uh, any crossbars or anything like no, that. No, no. Just like it's necessary. No, I don't think so. Um, the two inch is plenty. Yeah. Um, 
for, I mean, these power cubes are like 300 pounds. Quarter inch thick, yeah, yeah, that, that frame, quarter inch steel, it, it could be pretty heavy. So, okay, so, yeah, let's see, what else do I have written on my log? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try doing some of the plumbing parts here with the pipe workbench, I hope. I, I don't know how much flexibility there is in that for these different styles of piping, but let's see if the pipe workbench can take some different dimensions. The PVC design, I think, is a little different than the MBT and metal pipe designs, but uh, I'm going to try to put the numbers into spreadsheets and see what it will generate. I, I'm kind of thinking it it's kind of like the opposite on some of the dimensions from the PVC, so it may not quite work right because of the underlying logic in there, but I'll, I'll, I'll figure that out. Wait, do we have right now the capacity to, to make our own custom dimensions right now without CSV files, or we have to add it to the CSV files? Uh, all it is is that you, you just put it in a spreadsheet and export CSV file with the dimensions. Uh, so call is as... as um, so I was saying, it's just there's just several dimensions for most plumbing parts. Um, in some ways, the the only issue is is the PVC parts have um, the way they're built is there's subtraction, subtractive construction on the in. Abe, you cut out on us there. Uh, as we wait for Abe to come back in, who else has any reporting to do today? I, I, do we have um, Ruslan on anything else? Yes. Please go ahead as we wait for Abe to reconnect. Yes, we can. Uh, migrating it. Um, uh, yeah. And migra uh, migrating means here that uh, I will use a pipe out dimension uh, and the pipe thickness here probably in all parts. Uh huh. And I add an additional dimension by. Okay. Uh, I made um, a fix several bugs. And um, now uh, there, is, uh, there is a little issue uh, which blocks me mm -hmm. with this uh, migration process. Uh, I just realized there are some inconsistency or the inconsistency from my point of view. How you name or how you count Tell me more, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, uh, in a catalog, we 
which I have, uh, which I use uh, to derive my dimensions, they use a uh, um, particular number. Uh, you see on the left side, it is M, H, and G. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, it depends from uh, manufacturer. But these things, this inconsistency just stopped me. And I don't know how I can... I, and I keep this inconsistency. And then you have a table with, where one part of the pipes counts uh, uh, left, up, right, and the other, other dimensions are refers left, Right, so can you just uh, fix that in a table? Can you just fix the table? Or... declare it, I mean, would it hurt you if you declare left, right, and then vertical? Because left and right, it could be right and left. It doesn't matter, really. I would prefer to know if there are some standards. Otherwise, uh, I would uh, have a problem with other... Uh, uh -huh. ...when integration of other parts, and then I need to uh, re re redo all my work again. I see. Okay, so have you searched that, what the standard is for naming? Okay. just go the main the way I would do it that makes sense to me is to go through the main if it's a T call the one that's that's on the side 
the secondary one. The main one is the flow through. So say the left and right, <clears throat> the vertical should be like the third, third name, third piece in the name. And that's what I would do. Yeah. Uh, now the the kind of fitting that you're talking about, I've never used one, but that's interesting. If we have 3D printing, we can print them out so we can start using them. But I can just tell you, in practice, I have not ever seen a T that's got different left and right. I've seen different vertical than the left and right, but I've never seen left and right that are different from each other. They're not a standard thing you get at the store. But it's good for 3D printing because we can start... They are very useful, I would say. Um, but um, not common. I use uh, a catalog of uh, Edna Plastics and they yeah. offer. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, That's yeah. Why, uh, the, pre the previous version, which, uh, um, which is on GitHub in the master branch, it has only uh, two dimensions, but the new one has three, uh, which I made this uh, this week. No, the last week. And I also uh, made some reinforcement. If you, uh, for example, uh, uh, the new fitting, T fitting allows uh, the, di uh, the diameter uh, M1 be larger than diameter M. And uh, this. Uh, uh huh. Uh, I need some, uh, some additional cylinder. Otherwise, it, it looks uh, ugly. Uh-huh. Right. I try to... Uh, uh, ma many little dimensions... Uh, by the way, if you look at this graph, you see that I use some uh, blue uh, uh, marks. And uh, this what you will not see uh, when you use a graphical user interface. It's only for developer. Did you generate that with QCAD? Or LibreCAD? Uh, LibreCAD. LibreCAD, yeah. Yep. That's good, that's good. Um, yeah, okay. No, I mean, uh, the, the, to begin with... Yeah, I mean, you're going way beyond the call of duty. We, we started with, uh, you know, simple, uh, <laughs> simple amount of... PVC pipe and fittings, you're really going out to all kinds of different ones, so uh, that's good. Um, but as far as to make those decisions, I mean, uh, what decisions do we need to make right now then, let's say? Uh, if, you, if you have some examples of some information, some specification mm. that I can follow, we'll uh, speed up uh, the developer process because I... Uh, I don't have enough experience in this kind of uh, uh, problems, technical problems. Yeah. Uh, and if you have more experience, you will be efficient to, yeah. to find uh, No, uh, I can't what help should... so much on those because I, I haven't really used those crazy ones that you're designing. So, no, I haven't really gotten that far. Now, there are documents that from um, ASME, ANSI, AS, AS, like all these ones. But the problem is a lot of them, you have to buy them online. They don't, can't, a lot of times you can't just download it. Like, I know the standards. What you can go to is, I mean, there's ISO, DIN, ASME, NFPA. Like, just Google... Um, pipe fitting standards and just see if you can locate one. I haven't I haven't worked a lot with those because I just use the stuff we use typically and also for the purpose of general replicability uh, we just don't use a lot of the the crazy ones uh, but they will be useful at some point they're just not going to be that common right so but if you want to be comprehensive within our workbench we have to dig up those those sta actual standards documents so we find what that standard number is and <clears throat> whether we can get that document 
and we have to declare okay we go by such and such standard now uh, are you making your pipe fittings designer pipe fittings that they don't necessarily fit one standard but they can be any standard that we like just by defining what those dimensions are is that what you're doing yes. right yes. yeah um, yeah so so the thing that you can do is yeah I mean this is beyond my pay grade here and <laughs> I haven't looked at those the details of the standards but but for any uh, but what you can do is select one of the standards and say okay this is how they define it then you have to see if the standards are uniform with other standards like do they also label things a certain way I just don't know that so I don't have enough experience with that okay. yeah uh, do you have access to a library um, no we're, we're poor don't really have access to that City library, uh, yeah. There's a no. There's um. Yeah, the close. It might have that somewhere at a place like yeah. There's a university that's about half an hour away from us, but uh, but I guess I haven't really thought about that. <clears throat> um, because I uh, last time uh, uh, when I started to, to develop uh, this fittings, I, I went. Uh -huh. to a technical university which is uh, close to my yeah. place yeah. I actually studied there yeah. uh, and uh, because it's a German university I mostly see uh, German standards right uh, this is Jen yep. um, uh, it, I, uh, stop me if I'm understanding this incorrectly this one, are you looking for somebody to go to a library and look up standards for you? I can do that. I'm in Seattle. I can do that. So if you contact me via email and tell me what you need, I'll go look stuff up. Is that, is that what you need? You need somebody to go to a library and access the standards document. Mm -hmm. Yep. The first step would be to find out which from all these standards I really need. Yeah, let, let me just get back out. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the advantage you have um, compared to my case, you have access to much more um, U.S. standards than I have. Because the library, they usually buy uh, partic uh, only particular standards and uh, in my case, they are European, German, and few ISO standards, but uh, not typical. Uh, yeah, so I a couple of the people Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, Jen, you want to type, I, in, I, I, type yeah. in your email there? I, I had also, like, you're not a, it is absolutely not a problem. I did it Excellent, excellent. Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure where or how to do that, but yeah, absolutely, I'll, we'll figure it out. We'll get we'll get in contact. Okay. It's Jennifer Silves at gmail dot com. Yes, Jennifer Lee Silvis, J E N N I F E R L E E S I L V is in Victor E S at gmail. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. excellent. Yeah, I typed it into the chat box there, Ruslan. So. Uh, maybe you can tell tell Jen a little more, but the idea is pretty simple. Look up the standard for for pipe fittings and see how they label it. You know, like. But maybe Ruslan, since you you're well versed at this, maybe give Jen more specific directions on which standards she she want to look up or like which specific questions you have. Because I mean, do you want it for everything or just the T's? That that so so maybe you can communicate with Jen and, and let her know where you're at. Yeah.
yeah uh, I don't know if you guys heard me but Ruslan please provide any further details to Jen uh -huh. yep that'll be good excellent excellent teamwork that's good Yep. If, if you want to, uh, to use my uh, uh, work, uh, work page, uh, pay attention, I will change to uh, the dimensions. Uh, and uh, there will be a large update. Uh, also, be careful of Flamingo implementation, they are experimental. you were still updating the workbench. I'm not even sure I had the latest version installed, but uh, you'd update that because it seems to me that that it is, uh, hopefully the underlying code is, is flexible enough. It sounds like from what I looked at before, I looked at the files there that you had with, with uh, LibreCAD. And I don't know, I guess I need to learn to use LibreCAD better, but it, it looks to me like as long as you have the same number of dimensions, you can draw those however you want it and, and then it, it should work right yeah. but it's it's kind of based on the having the, the it has to line up with the code right and some of that may be the the labels I guess I guess the dimensions yes for example I, I changed name to what number uh, uh, during the last uh, uh, developer meeting we spoke about uh, how, how you call this uh, button? I, I asked about proper naming of part number. And yeah, that's why I want to have uh, some consistent naming there. And uh, w which is more important, I switch from a uh, pipe outer diameter plus pipe inner diameter to uh, pipe outer diameter plus the pipe thickness. Uh, all, all the three dimensions uh, uh, depend from each other. You, you, if you have two, you can calculate uh, the other one. Okay. If, if you think yes? I think you were probably talking about it a little bit while I was disconnected. My only concern was that if some of the metal parts, they don't just have different dimensions, the PVC, there's like subtraction or there's, there's I don't know if it's subtract, uh, subtractive uh, construction in the CAD, but it's, uh, the metal parts have more protrusions on the outside usually, the way their design is, they're thicker on the ends, unlike the PVC, which is thinner on, on the ends usually on the inside. So I, I don't know, uh, just hopefully just changing the LibreCAD, I, I don't know how, uh, if it matters how it's constructed in the CAD using the code, if it'll be able to do the metal parts just by changing the dimensions. Is that um, what you were talking about? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, uh, I, ha I have some shapes which I think uh, the PVC part I will buy look like so sometimes it's a guess i don't have uh yeah precise information i just for example if i have a, a pipe which connects two different uh pipes with two different diameters i connect them through a code and then i will put it in such a way that uh, the maximal uh, that the maximal thickness of or the fitting um, the maximal the, the minimal thickness of uh, of the fitting stay preserved as some little calculation um, and yes I guess it's obviously there's different parts you've got different uh, 2D CAD drawings for different parts, and I see some of those have some more complex shape to them, including 
tapers and angles and so on, besides just the curves, is it is it really difficult to um, to make make uh, angles uh, for tapered parts on the pipe there? Is that, what, what is the question? What is the, can you uh, write uh, the word on the chat? I, I don't know the translation of this one. Um,
for our purpose, uh, more precisely. And uh, what, what, there is also, I think, a good example for different shapes. Um, Slide six. the, the 
appreciate more like I think the lab because the way they're milled, they have uh, they need to have thicker ends. So I wasn't sure how well the CAD would construct like like size size M. Uh, I think on the right needs to be larger than uh, was that H? I guess well H H may be the distance up above. I'm not sure. Um, yes. We could eventually use, probably, Ruslan, some documentation on how people can take this and do what you do with this. I don't know if you can never do that in the future, but no, I, what you did here, it's pretty good. Like, we can do our custom custom fittings. It'd be good to transfer that, that know-how to some other people on a team as well. Hopefully, I, I don't think I looked at the code too much. Hopefully, it's not too hard to understand. How, how it works because I think I think that's the only other issue. It's, if it's simple enough, I think looking at the drawings and then some of the the, the code. I don't know which parts to look at, but um, maybe maybe some information about that would be helpful. What to look at? Oh, but the the simple uh, the simple way to do it uh, to create a pattern with a one page uh, and. Uh, Of, uh, re uh, result of, of this combination. 
probably separate enough, it's pretty good at figuring out the solids to make, and based on the thickness, then the, the, the inner parts are um, generated mostly from, from uh, the other dimensions, and just subtracts those from the inside. But it sounds like it's pretty automated, as long as you give it um, the inner dimensions, I guess. And, uh, okay. The cone, I see there's a cone in that one too, which is pretty complex, so um, I was wondering how adaptable the, the, the code is there. It looks like that, that's complex enough that, I wonder how, how, um, how much the code, it depends on how the different parts of the, of the code are. Most of the, I guess the shape, is, as long as the labels are similar, uh, the labels are, are the same or it makes sense in the context of the, the shape of the part, the code can probably figure out how to make uh, a variety of different um, part shapes based on the, the, the labels yes. dimensions made. So, For example, I, now I use a flamingo, uh, flamingo it, uh, the advantage of flamingo is that you can change as flexibility flex Now I increase the lead diameter, you see what happens. Uh, you're an OSC piping workbench. What are you doing there? This is not flamingo workbench. Uh, this? Yeah. Uh, You use Flamingo. Yes, Is uh, Flamingo okay. it's a separate workbench as well? So Flamingo is a workbench. Flamingo has a separate workbench um, as well. I, I wasn't aware that that was separate. I thought it was just a library uh, for, for doing uh, pipe related code. Did yeah. It complete a different workbench? It, Yeah. Because if, if, the, if the pipe is if the different 
type of standard piping is shaped a little bit different. You can just edit uh, yeah. the underlying shape. So, yeah. <laughs> right, right. It's an octo. I guess, Abe, you could probably, like if you poke into the code, you could probably just take Ruslan's algorithms and just make new fittings with them, new combinations, right? Well, but okay. Uh, How about just a hex snip? <clears throat> hex snip. Can you do a hex snip right now? Right now, without coding. No. You probably can't, no. right? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Like, I mean, uh, the the other question would be, Ruslan, are you still planning on working on a? No. It's, see, you got other things to do, man. You got you got to do the um, the construction set construction set workbench, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we don't want you to be doing mo too much more of that, but but I think. Um, we want to pass it on to others because I know that for hydraulics fittings, hydraulics fittings are a little different. Some of them have O-rings and they're <clears throat> pretty much different design. So we'd want to leave that for somebody else. But I think you should make sure you get to the next step, which is I think more important. That is the facilitating the design of new workbenches. You know. Yeah. So you're still on schedule for the next next part of your roadmap? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I am, uh, I'm, I don't, uh, I the schedule. Uh, I, uh, okay, excellent, excellent. Just tell me, 
uh, was the idea that after you finish the OSC workbench, were you going to actually add that into Flamingo, so so that they they take no, some of. It's not. A, uh, I will not add it to Flamingo. I will use code. Uh, for okay. Okay. Okay, and the Flamingo guys, you haven't had any discussions that they would actually take some of your code to add more, <clears throat> more capability to theirs. Uh, no, it's some kind. Of, um, they have some general ideas, and I extend them their ideas by adding uh, some details. Okay. Yeah. And also for some construction, which I have, for example, uh, three uh, different uh, frames, we need more details than just to say, here we can, uh, here we have two pipes, and they are connected in a rectangular angle. It's not, not uh, enough, I think, for us. Uh, and that's why I, I extend uh, uh, some code of Okay. Or you can also use uh, my workbench without Flamingo. Then you don't have this flexibility. You will, you will have a possibility in the fast way creating the physics. Um, are you releasing, like, what, what do you recommend that people use yours with Flamingo extension, right? Uh, later, yes, when, uh, when the old uh, API is fixed. Okay, but okay. Uh, Okay, okay, so just, just don't check the part, Use, just don't use that feature right now. Okay, okay. But the code, you're keeping one branch of the code, you're not doing one that's got the flamingo capacity and one without it, you're keeping the code one? Okay, okay. Okay, okay, that sounds good for now. So, it was more than five minutes. It was a little more than five minutes. Um, but thank you for information. Yes, it, it was well worth it. Uh, what we have there is state of art, state of art. <laughs> Where else are you going to get a, a whole array of open source pipe fittings? But Ruslan's workbench. Okay. So... Anyone else have anything? I don't think we have. I think we lost everybody else while we were talking. So, so that's pretty good. No, uh, anyone else uh, got any other reports or anything? Any questions? Because we can. I can start wrapping up then. I know Jen mentioned a potential workshop regarding some place in Pennsylvania as far as 3D printers. Jen, you're still on, or is that somebody else? No, I'm, I'm still on. Yeah. Um, yeah, David and I are going to talk about it this weekend. Yeah. A lot too, so we're going to talk about it this weekend. He's um, going to try to get a group together, and he, he'll need more detail. You know, yeah. Cost stuff, but he's very interested. Okay. That's cool. What city is that in Pennsylvania? Uh, Pittsburgh, I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a definite possibility. Yeah, we're open to that. We're going to just need a lot of practice running more and more of these, and so forth so yeah let's continue the discussion on that I have a question yep uh, at the beginning you mentioned uh, the micro factory yeah and yeah and um, do we have uh, topic logistic in our OSE uh, wiki because uh, oh yeah 
Yeah. Right. Well, um, right. You s the warehouse in our case looks a little different in that it's more the micro factory where we don't stock stuff. Everything is as much on-demand production as, as possible, but of course you're going to need some feedstocks to, to store some feedstocks to do that. And ideally that is most localized that you can get a lot of the feedstocks locally. The model of the OSC campus uh, what I'd like to, to do is to demonstrate that a parcel of land can prov provide just about anything, right? So you can get your <clears throat> turn your cellulose into bioplastics, and you can make aluminum from clay, you can make hydrogen from water, you can make bricks from clay, etc. And as far as the steel, <clears throat> take some scrap steel, melt it down, turn it to virgin steel, and so forth. But you're an expert in logistics because that's what you do for a living so uh, one one question there is is there anything relevant that you're doing that can actually help us given that we're doing the distributed micro factory as our model uh, any thoughts on that yes please go ahead uh, I think uh, some open source inventory systems uh huh uh, I think uh, a micro factory Yes. Have a, a lot of little details. Yes, yes. And hard to find. Mm -hmm. uh, no, or to, to find out if we have enough of screws, uh, let's say screws, right. M6 uh, lengths. Yep. This and that. Inventory is big, yes. Now, the, the thing that we do know is there's uh, called a program called Odoo, which is the open enterprise planning system which is uh, open ERP used to be called its Odoo community edition they have modules for that so there's some software in there already that uh, just big enterprise resource planning packages that are open source like Odoo have you heard of Odoo? Yes this is what we use uh, for our project Oh you do? So are you building like proprietary nodules on top of Odoo or? Or are they open source? I'm not sure. I don't, uh, I don't use it. Uh, there are other persons from my research team uh -huh. who use it. But as far as I know, uh, the results, uh, of all of most of the results which we will uh, produce during our research, they will go open source. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. How much of that capacity that we would need is already in Odoo? I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, it, it is uh, just some uh, useful and pretty uh, um, famous. Yeah, yeah, it's well known, and <clears throat> and for me, it's well known. Yeah. Piece of yeah. Yeah. Uh, less to mention. It. Yeah. Right, and Lulzbot uses that so it's definitely good yeah. maybe I also thought about, thought about some kind of micro uh, inventory uh, with, uh, which would be automatic to, uh, whether it's for example whether it's possible to have some small uh, small room with a lot of um, boxes. Right. And, uh, if you need something, then these boxes will be transported to you in some automatic way. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, yes, I definitely thought about something like that. If you can, for example, like when we're preparing for a workshop, our slave robot could actually get all the parts out for us, because that's a lot of work. Um, but one question would be, <clears throat> To do the actual inventory, somebody's got to count stuff or st scan stuff. It would be so great if you could have the artificial intelligence computer vision where, the, say, the robot opens up your drawer and actually counts for you how many of a certain thing they are <clears throat> by recognizing it, you know, things like that, uh, which definitely will happen sometime in the future. But for now, it's like, of course, we pick out the, the parts manually. 
So, but yeah, I mean, it's a big topic. That's a big, huge topic. Um, for now, I think the simple thing that we can do is simple scanning, like, like I guess, RFID and scanning or whatever. But then if you have, you're talking about screws, which are, you need a lot of them, how do you inventory that? Do you count them? That's, you know, we use a lot of screws, for example. How do you, how do you inventory your screws and bolts and nuts? You can have a box with, hmm? by weight. Weight, yeah. And you have a dedicated place. Yeah. Right. I have an organization along the seven shops have, um, well, they spend a lot of shops spend a lot of money on these different organization systems with trays and you know walls and portable uh, you know cabinets and all that kind of stuff. But I, I don't know what kind of system you guys just have shelves, right? With different bins. Yeah, yeah, we have a lot of different bins. Yeah. The tour with the, the scale if you check the weight of the part and then the mass. Yeah. It'll be one way. Mm hmm. And I guess that could be automated by machine. And it, that's not like the vision systems should be pretty good. You know what? One, one relatively simple way to do that say we have a wall of bins like these. Right now we use these ones that are like a little drawer so imagine your automated system you have a wall of these and the automated system simply takes one after another puts them on a scale weighs them and gives you a complete report that would be something that would be executable actually pretty uh, not too much effort I mean you have a a motion system that or some robot arm or something that picks up the drawer and weighs it one by one and say you have like 50 drawers uh, or a hundred drawers, you know, that that would take that from a task that takes you a day to, you know, like, no time, really. And then it would say it's connected to an automatic ordering system that if you know you, you're missing some of some part, it knows that it has to order that for you automatically, so you totally annihilate the inventory scheme, you know. That becomes automatic. No, I, I, yeah, it's just. <laughs> I mean, look at this. We have the universal access right now, right? Uh, that's a motion system. We could apply the universal access to pick these things up. Uh, say you got the easiest implementation. Make a robot, an XYZ robot, which is based on a universal axis, so it moves just like the 3D printer, and you just program it to pick up, to go to each drawer, <clears throat> go to it, pick it up, and put it on a scale. I mean, we could implement something like that probably in a month's time if we put our attention to it. Uh, and it probably would be worth it, like, in a, you know, now that we're starting to talk about this, we never really talked about this. But yeah, something, a simple system that's based on a universal axis would be perfect. And that's why we're very deliberate on designing si simple systems like the universal axis over which we have complete control. We don't have to do any innovation to build, say, a big frame for that big robot to make that happen. That's the beauty of our construction set approach. So when, when I say just, that's why I mean just, because we can use all the technology that we have that's already standard and we know how to work with it, you know. And then, of course, the software on top of that, that would be pretty much all of that because mechanically we could make it happen. We need an algorithm. Okay, what exactly are we doing? Are we just weighing this, picking up and weighing? Uh, the mechanical, we can impl implement that pretty readily, then it just becomes the algorithm and the code that, that would be the, the challenges here. So if you have any ample spare time, please uh, come up with a code. <laughs> well, we can develop uh, the, uh, um, the robot, universal axis, a universal screw, one size fits all. Oh yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, well, but the other thing, so the other part of inventory, what I did think about is on-demand production. So say you now have, which is part of the GVCS, you have your screw machine or automated CNC multi-machine, 
that's multi-headed based on a universal axis and rotary axis system so it's like like the screw machine uh, an automated lathe that makes screws and then instead of inventorying you're feeding that with rod and you're making all the screws and bolts and everything on demand using machining that's another way to go and that's exactly what screw machines do they produce parts um, on demand well nobody does it on demand but for us I thought it would be nice if we had in our micro factory when we run a workshop we can produce the actual screws on demand using this automated CNC machining Well, conceptually it's simple. To execute it, it's not, of course. No, not true if you have advanced CNC machining. Absolutely not true. The point is that with us, I mean, Google, look at some screw machines, what they do. Once you have that machine, the thing can pull magic out of thin air. I mean, you really got to, I, I looked at this for a long time on uh, examining how those systems work, but there is no advantage that a big factory has for a screw machine. It might have a hundred of these machines, but a single machine is enough for us. If we, if we want to build 12 printers like next week. A single single screw machine would do that in a few hours. So I don't agree with that point actually, S because of the advanced most, technology that we have. Like, I, think, I think most bolts and screws that most of them seem to be cast, which is probably yeah, it depends. Of the, that you have to cast them. Milling them depends on the nature of the stock. Depends. Like, it depends. You but you have to buy the stock rod and shift that. Right. So right. Yeah, yeah, but the question is like one one of the perennial themes of OSE is the sufficiency criterion. What are we trying to do? If we have stock, which is very cheap, it's cheaper than the screw. Yeah, we can start with, for example, rod stock, and feed that automatically into the machine, so we can produce a bunch of that. So. No, another discussion. But anyway, that's let let's just say that's that's happening. Like I think that, um, of course, we don't have it right now. But what exactly are the limits of on-demand production? Because because remember, we have the induction furnace as part of the the micro factory, right? So if you have induction furnace, then what I see happening, you've got scrap steel coming in one end. And things like the parts and rods for the 3D printer out the other. That's the reality we're setting up for. Now, that's a lot of technology in there, but it's all just algorithms and 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 linear motion and rotary motion. That's all it is, and that's, that's where the universal axis come in. need to be designed and, and built. I guess it's a matter of priority which ones people design, which ones first. You know, so. Well, I mean, that's... When, what I'm talking about is the full recursion where we can go from from uh, feedstocks, common feedstocks. I mean, we're not there yet, but right now we just buy those all of those things off the off the shelf, right? I mean, this is this is for the future, yeah. but um, uh, yeah. As far as the machine design, what design? As I recall, for a shop, the one machine that can build all the other machines is, is or that you need is a lathe, right? So if you're going to automate something. Machine. Well, that's what a screw machine is. A screw, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the screw machine is an automated lathe. So basically, yeah. one of the most powerful things you can do is that automated screw machine. You guys got to look it up. See some videos I, of screw machines. Yeah, I pressed into that. An automated full CNC machine. I think the difficulty for those is there's a lot of need for precision machining just to build the thing. It, Itself. It's like you, yeah, it's like you've got to have one to build it. It's, right, right. Yeah. There. Yep. Um, exactly, exactly. Hey, but I, let's. Uh, I think you underestimate uh, a lot of uh, things. And the uh, I, I see here yeah. a sample kind of machine. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah.
look, um, there are screws, different screws, and some of them are good and some of them are bad. Even if they optically look the same, and I'm pretty sure that the company which uh, produces good quality screws will have some know-how information, like, for example, which uh, which um, metal uh, is uh, most suitable for particular task and uh, some uh, metal quality plays a, an important role and uh, what the meaning of metal quality means I suppose that, that all, all the metals which are uh, all the chemical elements right. within uh, this material are very precise Yes, they are precise for particular for functions. It's just an example. Uh, absolutely. The, absolutely. A big challenge for the induction furnace infrastructure is also part of that is alloying. So, for example, you what you do there is you wire feed different metals into your mix to get the proper qualities if you want that. But you can also avoid that if you if you use general purpose steel, like like a formula for steel that's say very flexible for a lot of purposes so so it depends depends what your and goal then, is yep and another thing when uh, temperature play a role uh, you, you need to post i don't know the uh, professional term for it but uh, the cooling and uh, uh, heating of metal change your properties a lot of course so Yeah, you're talking about stuff that hundreds of different PhDs know. All I'm saying is that over time, all that information will be open source and accessible. Yes, there's absolutely a lot of, uh, you know, thousands of PhDs of worth of knowledge that I'm talking about. Um, but that's that's what we're that's that's exactly the problem statement. All right. No, no, no. I'm not forgetting about any of that. It's the point is uh, the devil's in the details. I'm just giving you the the broad stroke description. When you go into it, there's a lot of detail, right? So uh, details which we don't have, and that's why we're working on the open source, open sourcing all of this. Just like, for example, you're open sourcing the the pipes. It's it's all these details that matter. Okay, hey guys, I gotta get, I gotta get going though. Yeah, I got a meeting. Um, but let's let's continue next week on our further discussions of the open source microfactory level one and two. But it might be an appropriate time that I can start sharing some of this. Like, well, what exactly are the capacities that we're talking about right now, versus what's coming up in the future, in, included in the GVS, GVCS versus not? Um, but if you miss it, don't worry about it. That's why I'm writing a book on it. So that I mean, I'm going to cover a lot of this stuff in my book actually. So. Uh, basically trying to show that um, what does that picture look like because uh, I kind of live that and um, kind of need to share that um, share what I know about that from the experiences we've gained here already okay guys but I gotta get going so so let's talk next week thanks for a good meeting and let's continue on this as we open source the world's economy bye bye guys <laughs>